Welcome to the Harwood Hustle powered by PGC Basketball. We believe in the value of a coach. We're here to educate, empower, and encourage you to lead like never before. This week, TJ and Sam discuss recent March Madness events and coaching strategies. In this episode, they cover off rebounding, three-point shooting, game pressure, style of play, and what wins come tournament time. Let's get started. Welcome to the Hardwood Hustle. Today, Sam and I are going to talk NCAA tournament and not just kind of like what's going on in the tournament, but what are some learnings that we've got from the tournament, things that you might be able to use with your team. We've got four different things that we're going to talk about that come up over the course of a season. And the first one we're going to talk about is rebounding. Sam, why don't you share what Clark Kellogg said about rebounding and let's dive into how coaches might be able to apply or use that or interpret that. Yeah, so in studio, Clark Kellogg made a comment, I'm paraphrasing, but he said boxing out is overrated. And it triggered a lot of debate and conversation online, TJ, just about that that comment. You know, traditional thinking would tell you, yeah, we need to box out. That that would be kind of what coaches said when you and I were coming up and playing. We've got to box out. Um, whereas more new age or now you'll find some coaches who don't talk about boxing out. They talk about pursuing the ball. And um, so, yeah, that's the opening comment we can talk about is, is boxing out overrated? Yeah. And, you know, my thought on rebounding is, you know, offensively, I think we dive into what do players do well and how do we get them into those spots? And I think some degree we do that on defense. Like what are they capable of and gearing it towards what they're capable of on rebounding? we kind of have a one size fits all approach. You know, I think some people don't do many rebounding drills at all. They just work on pursuing the ball a lot. Some people do a ton of rebounding drills where everything's boxing out. And I think we might be missing the mark a little bit there. You know, I've had players that are really good rebounding 15 feet to their left, right, forward and backwards. I've also had players that, Hey, they could box out, but if the ball doesn't come right to them, they don't get it very often. And I think some of that, is just like a nose for the ball. I think some of it can be taught and grown, but at the same time, not all rebounders are created equal, in my opinion. I agree. And it depends what type of team you have. It depends situation and scenario. I mean, my my line of thought is, like, if you're a smaller team, you better emphasize boxing out, physicality. Uh, And when I say boxing out, let me be more clear. That could be like really boxing out, TJ. That could be like a hit and get, or you're going and hitting somebody, checking them, and then going and getting the ball. But if you have a team that's bigger and longer and more athletic, I mean, I don't know that you would need to spend a ton of time in practice doing box out drills because they might just be able to go get it, and and you don't you just don't need to sit. So I think. It all depends, like to our friend Sefu Bernard, who says it depends. Should I go under the ball screen or go over? Should I trap it? Should I play motion offense or should I play move or block? Like it depends. It depends on personnel. And that, that's where it's like it's not a – it's just like a black or white issue. You have to depend – it depends on the team you coach. Yeah, and sometimes I think it matters more than just on the team that you coach. Um I, you know, I, I think this is one that you probably need to build a philosophy around, but I've had teams that are smaller that we've tried to make really physical. And to be honest with you, like bigger guys just went over our back and got the ball. And I've wondered, should we even really spend that much time doing it or should we just go after the ball? And I, you know, if you, if I had to pick, do I want big and athletic that doesn't rebound outside of their space? Or do I want players with a nose for the ball that just pursue it? I'm picking nose for the ball. They just pursue it. You know, I gave the example. I had a point guard that averaged 10 rebounds a game several years ago for us. And look, I can take no credit for that. Like he just had a nose for the ball and he went and got it. And we won the rebounding margin pretty significantly that year. Uh, because everybody kind of did their job. We had some bigs that we just focused on boxing out and keeping their guy out. And then we had one or two guys that just pursued it really well. So I don't think every year is the same. And I think when we build a philosophy, it could change from year to year based on your personnel and what you need to be doing. But I I kind of agree with what Clark Kellogg said, that I, I would value a relentless pursuit of the ball over a good box out. 
I think players that want the ball, I, I was watching the game last night, Farley Dickinson, and they were playing, and I was like, how are they rebounding? They were the smallest team in the NCAA tournament. And I don't think they were that fundamentally sound with box outs or anything like that, but they did have guys going after the ball and really pursuing it hard. Yeah, I agree. They they were I, I noticed that too. They they do pursue it. I mean, but two things you said there, you talk about your point guard getting ten rebounds a game, you know, but you kind of just made kind of a brush over comment. you you had other guys boxing out. Like that freed him up to go get it. If those guys didn't box out, he's going in there amongst six, five, six, eight, six, nine kids trying to rebound. He's not gonna rebound. <coughs> so other guys had to get the re or do their job of boxing out. The second thing is, how do you teach pursuing the ball? Like he had great instincts, but I I do think you can teach players. I think that comes from like reading the ball out of the shooter's hands, noticing the flight of the ball. When you do partner shooting drills in practice, I think you have to teach kids like to be an active rebounder, anticipate. I think you can train that and develop it. Uh, and so I don't, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think you can train and develop it? Yeah. You know, looking back on the end of this season, I think for us, like rebounding is one of those things that we know it's important, but there's so many things to cover in basketball. And sometimes I think you shy away from rebounding because it's not the easiest thing to cover. You know, like, I mean, sometimes you say, all right, I'm gonna throw the ball up and three people box out and go get it. And it's like, does that translate? Right. And so like coming up with things that translate, to making you a better rebounding team. Sometimes it feels like a checkbox thing where we did a rebounding drill today. And this is where I landed after evaluating. This is probably one of our biggest points of emphasis next year for our team is really just building that habit of rebounding, meaning whether we're playing one-on-one, two-on-two, three-on-three, whatever it is, it doesn't end till we rebound. Because a lot of times I think I made this mistake this year let's just say we're doing three on three shell drill or something like that. And then somebody shoots and, you know, I might blow the whistle before the rebound ever happens to make a point. And I did that quite often. And if I could do it over again, I would have let it go until the rebound was won. I, so if you were to ask me, what's the most important thing you can do to build a good rebounding team? I think it is just simply build the habit of the play never ends until we get the rebound. And then I think you encourage those to pursue it harder and, uh, or to box out more. I think everybody's got different, you know, ability, different talent. So maybe somebody's a better box out guy than they are a rebounder. Somebody's a better pursuer than they are a box out person. I think let people live in the lanes of where they're at, but no matter what it is, just build the habit of the rebound matters in everything that you do. That would be a big point of emphasis for us next year that I don't think I did a great job of this year. Yeah. And I think, I think, Rebounding is a big factor in winning and winning championships. Pat Summit said offense sells tickets, defense wins games, and rebounding wins championships. And I think there's some validity to that. I think the reality is too, you got to be a well rounded team, right? You've got to be efficient on offense, you got to be competitive on defense, and you got to rebound the ball because you could be a great defensive team if you don't finish it with rebounds. You're just going to keep playing defense and and you're not going to win a lot of games. So, yeah, it's uh, it depends. Right. I think that's the answer. Yeah, it depends. But I also really agree with his comment. Like, I, I think that we spend not enough time just encouraging players to pursue the ball. I mean, like when you watch these tournament games. There's a lot of guys just going after the ball, like just fighting for rebound, like just they're really pursuing and. Sometimes when I watch games, you know, I was just watching an AAU tournament this weekend and the average shot that went up, like if they were around it, some people pursued it. But there was a majority of people with 10 players on the floor. How many people pursued the rebound on every possession? Like maybe one, you know what I mean? And they stood out a little bit because they pursued the rebound, even if they didn't get it. But I think that that can become a habit that people just easily get away from where they don't build the habit of pursuing the ball and just being hungry to rebound. And it's a skill. Like, I mean, Dennis Rodman, I know he gets used all the time, but that's an undersized guy that did some amazing things on the glass because he really went after and working on the craft of pursuing the ball. So, you know, coaches, I think big takeaway for you here is like thinking about next year. Like, what are you actually going to do to be a good rebounding team? This is never an easy question to, to answer, but I think you need to think about Clark Kellogg's comment on 
getting better at helping players pursue the ball and building building the habit of pursuing it. Sam, let's move on to the second one right here. Um, game pressure. This is something I keep hearing in interview after interview, uh, a commentator after commentator. You know, three point percentage is like at thirty percent for the tournament. Um, players aren't making shots. You can even see players not even taking shots. I mean, this happened in the Purdue game. I, numerous games where players just aren't even taking the shots. They're second guessing what they're doing. A uh, 30% is really low, especially this day and time, the way players shoot the three ball. But they keep talking about game pressure and the building up of game pressure. What can coaches do to better handle and better prepare their players for game pressure? Because as you go on in your season, the pressure amps up. Well, so the question is, you know, why are the percentages lower? I think this is an interesting one. Well, first off, Purdue is not a very good three-point shooting team. And that bit them. I mean, watching that game, I think you, you said you watched it. It was painful to watch. There were guys just catching wide open. They wouldn't let it fly. You know, they, they didn't shoot it. They didn't shoot it well. Um, so at the college level, TJ, some people are like, well, you got to recruit it. You know, and then the debate comes, well, can you recruit it or should you develop it or both? Um, so my thought, it's multifaceted. One, tournament games are even more pressure. So I don't have the stats in front of me, and I, you and I haven't done a breakdown of the last. Like, if you look at tournament games, TJ, versus regular season, historically, I'd be interested to know our tournament three-point percentage is way down because of the pressure the pressure of the moment. That's one thought, a question I'd want to know too. And I don't, I don't think this applies for the college or pro level. When you know this, when I, when I was a player in high school, you play in a high school gym. Well, when we went to the state tournament and I went down to Georgia tech and played in their big arena, it was a completely different depth perception as a high school player stepping in with the backdrop and that affects a shooter. Now, I think a lot of these guys are used to uh, – let me back up. I think a lot of the power five players are used to shooting in big arenas. Low and mid-majors, they're playing in smaller gyms sometimes, so I think that could factor in. That, these are kind of outside-the-box thoughts on it, but I think pressure of the moment, arenas or style of arena can affect that perception. Um Maybe defense is better. That'd be my third one. Defense is better. Yeah, and I think you're you're talking a lot about three point percentage, and I and I think that it's it's showing up. Game pressure is showing up there in three point percentage, but I also think it's showing up across the board in other aspects too, not just three point percentage. Like, I, if I was taking away a learning from the tournament of game pressure, here's what it would be: make your team the one that's on the attack. I, I just feel like when teams are out there playing not to lose, you're seeing them lose. You're seeing the game pressure get to them. And I'm thinking about the way they defend, the way they attack the rim, the way they shoot the three. I think that really the number one thing that I'm taking away from all of this game pressure is the team that is playing more loose, more aggressive, and more to win than not to lose is the more dangerous team. And so wait, and you're hold on. So you're saying that is a factor in the mindset of the shooter too. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it factors in everything. I mean, I think what you were talking about three point percentage, which I, I think is the easiest place to see it manifest. Like you can see players, whether they make or miss the three, you can see the game pressure. But I also think you can see the game pressure and whether they take it or don't take it. I think you can see it in, in just the shot selection. I think you can see it in a whole bunch of different aspects where it was really easy to see. And not just in that game, but a lot of games like Purdue was playing not to lose. I mean, you could see the pressure mounting on the players. You could see the pressure mounting on the coaches. I think Virginia has been in that situation a couple of times um, when they lost their 16 in one game. You know, I think it, and, and I'm sure like, you know, both coaches know that they know that's a possibility and they do everything they can to protect against it. But. Young kids are going to be young kids. They know the situation. They know what's going on. And so if I'm a coach going into that, and I know those coaches probably did everything they possibly could, but what is the one thing that I want to make sure happens come tournament time? Like I want to be the hunter and not the hunted. 
Like, how are we going to go in this game and be the more aggressive? We are going after winning, not trying to protect a losing team. Well, how, yeah, okay. Well, I agree with that point. That That's another kind of underlying factor. Um, I will say, like, the Purdue example, they're, they're a 32% three-point shooting team, which is pretty pretty low. If you look across the board, TJ, at the top three-point percentage teams, like, interestingly enough, like Michigan State, Xavier, they're top four in the country. Gonzaga is a top ten three-point shooting per, uh, team. Penn State is right there in the top 10. Those are all teams that we saw like, well, three of those teams are in the Sweet 16 out of the top uh, top 10. Um, But here's another factor. I think you mentioned it. Shot selection. A lot of times people are like, oh, we're not shooting it well. Well, look at the quality of the shot you take. You could be a great, like Steph Curry, as great of a shooter he is, or Clay Thompson, if they're not taking good shots, their percentages will drop. Uh, and especially at the college level. So you, the qual- shot quality matters. The line getting moved back as much as range is improved. I think the line getting moved back has a factor uh, as well. I think those are those are two other ones. Well, I think, I think game pressure affects shot selection. Like, I think not only just the shot. I think you, you look at the number of possessions in the tournament – where nobody even puts any rim pressure on until the last 10 seconds of the shot clock. I think part of that is defense is getting better, but I think that's also partly players not wanting to make a mistake, not wanting to overdrive it, not wanting to, I I mean, so yeah, I mean, Purdue is a low three point percentage team and they were basing their game on throwing the ball inside and playing inside. But I also think there was a multiple times when players could have been more aggressive and the, the fear factor played in there a little bit. And I think the teams, that have been to me to this point that have have been the best and have pulled upsets didn't feel that game pressure. And it could have been Jim simply because they were the underdog and there was no pressure. But I think if you're going to say, yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, that pressure's off because you got, you're playing with house money. Yeah. And so I think the key is how to take a team that is right there or favorite and flip that where they they're thinking about attacking. I think being in attack mode you know, whether that's starting out the game pressing, whether that's I don't know what it is, but I, I think as coaches, we need to be aware in these big games because it's not any different for high school or whatever. I mean, there's kids that go in, they think we're favored or this is my last high school game. If I leave, I got to take the jersey off like there are real pressures at every level that kids feel. And I think the main takeaway is how to make your team the one that's going after it versus trying to protect something. And I think that that's not an easy thing to do as a coach, but I think that's the goal of coming into tournament play is how do we not feel the game pressure? You know, how do we make sure that we're going after winning? Let's talk about the the third one here, Sam, which I think factors into this style of play. Like it's really fascinating. The NCAA tournament brings this to life every year. And, you know, I, I think coaches sitting at home, it could, could, this could be a real problem for coaches sitting at home watching these games, or it could be a real good thing for coaches sitting home watching these games. You can watch a team, and easily think, ooh, I want that style of play. Ooh, I want to play like that. Not knowing whether your players are capable of it. The one that's most interesting to me, Sam, most interesting. Like you hear people calling for Tony Bennett's job after they lost that 116 game. And then you start talking about what a, well, they're not any good in the tournament except for the year they won the national championship. You hear that people calling for Matt Painter's job at, Purdue after they're losing this game in the 116 matchup. There's no way this could ever happen. You go through this. First of all, I would say timeout and I would press pause. These guys won the ACC in the Big Ten, right? These guys are world-class phenomenal coaches. Now, there is some truth in their style of play might make them upset prone, but I think the flip side of that is true also. They don't win their leagues without playing their style of play at their particular institutions. Virginia is a real easy one for me. You're not going to recruit the same players at at Virginia that you're going to get at Duke and North Carolina. You have to have a different style of play. And Tony Bennett has done an amazing job there. Like to win ACC after ACC championship at Virginia, and then people want to complain about losing a tournament game here or a tournament game there, I think it's crazy. Well, okay, Th- that this is an interesting one. So when I think about style of play for myself as a coach, I think about 
Am I playing a style of play that can win in the postseason? Because their style of plays, TJ, I think would be fun to coach and fun to play in, like run and gun, shoot a ton of threes. But I don't, I don't think that that wins in the postseason. And so, like, I think you have to be good in the half court. I think you also have to be – me and you sat one of the first coaching clinic, maybe the very first coaching clinic I went to, me and you were in Las Vegas, and I listened to Hubie Brown. I remember Hubie Brown saying, you've got to have a fast break team. We don't hear fast break as much in today's game, but, like, you got to be able to convert in fast break opportunities. But you also got to be good in the half court. Now, to your point on Tony Bennett, when they got beat, by in the as the one seed by UMBC right that's who they beat beat them okay five years ago or six years ago me personally I even watched that game thinking man does Tony Bennett need to change his style of play they were so methodical low possessions low scoring and I'm thinking man when you play a team where you have more talent you give them a chance but the reality is what, where I land on it is, and good for Tony Bennett, they come back from a, a, a one-team losing, and then they win the national championship the next year. So in a one-game tournament, anything can happen. In the NBA, the better team's going to win out because you're playing a, a seven-game series. But I think in a one-game tournament, TJ, the style of play, you have to decide who you're going to be and, and feel comfortable in that, and then you go play it. And that being said, like even this year, I saw where you tweeted about somebody was clowning on Tony Bennett saying Virginia is not a good postseason. And then you tweeted something in defense of them. And I agree. Uh, all the kid has to do is his point guard has to hold the ball and get fouled and they win that game against Furman. I mean, kudos and credit to Furman for making a play. But um, my point is, yeah, style of play, you got to decide if you're comfortable with it. And then go coach it, whatever you're most comfortable doing. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, there's a lot of different styles that win. You know what I mean? There's, I mean, look, Tony Bennett won a national championship playing that way. There's other teams that have played different ways that have won national championships. I mean, the one thing we lose sight of is this is a one and done tournament, any one game can happen. Any one team can make a run. And I think we get really emotional and really carried away with all these different styles of play and thinking there's only one way to win. You want, I mean, look, the teams that win it have good players. You know what I mean? And that's a big part of why they win. Now, their style of play factors in, but there is a lot of things that go into that. And I, the biggest question I have said, let's, you know, if Tony Bennett spent all of his time trying to make a tournament team because there's one style that wins in the tournament is that worth sacrificing the ACC championships ACC tournament championships maybe they're not even a a top three seed and so now they play in, they play the seven or eight nine game and they don't even get past the first round because they're playing a better opponent like there's so many things that factor into that what I think coaches have to be confident in is discovering what type of players do I have what gives them the best chance to win and I got to believe in that, and I got to play that way. And this is who our team is. Like you, you can't just flip and make a, a certain style, a certain player play a certain style of game. You know what I mean? So wait, yeah. So wait, like I would say this though: Tony Bennett has won more ACC championships. You know, even even before Roy Williams and Coach K re re retired, TJ, he had won more ACC championships in a ten year span than than they had. Those are legends. So don't you think if you can win an ACC regular season championship that that style of play will play well in an NCAA tournament? Would you agree with that? Yeah. I, I would. I think so. But it is. A, it's a 40-minute game, and you could run into a hot hand. You could run into a, a nervous team. Here's my question to you. Tom Izzo's teams traditionally do very well in the NCAA tournament. They do. They advance and they they knock on the door, sweet 16s, final fours. And they, they sometimes have marginal years. They're not like just running through the Big Ten and like dominating. And then they go in the tournament and they go on runs. And, and why do his teams do that? Why did Coach K's Duke teams always – I mean, he went to, what, what, like 12 final fours. Like he was averaging a final four every three years, I think, for his whole career. 
And yes, he had great talent. Um, so that is a part of it. But why do is those teams, why do certain teams and style of plays work? What are the characteristics? Like I'm asking you on the spot. We didn't talk about this beforehand. Why do you think Tom is those teams do well? Well, look, I think it goes back to th this. I mean, first of all, you and I, there's a lot of factors that go in here, but that margin, right? Like field goal percentage, offense and defense. Right. And I think that just goes back to like Izzo's teams, they defend and they rebound. So they're going to have a shot. You know what I mean? And then when you put some players on there that are pretty good, that can score the ball. Like I don't love Houston's offense. That Sasser kid's really good. You know, they're going to defend and they're going to rebound. They're going to have a shot in any game they play. Can they make enough shots? Can they make, you know, like that's going to, that's going to factor in any team, but they're going to have those splits. Like they're going to, they're going to have a great chance of winning on the glass. They're going to defend every possession. And then it comes down to, okay, do you have enough offense to get over the hump? Do you have enough players to make, you know, to make buckets? Or is your system give you the opportunity to get to that place? I, but when it gets down to the Elite Eight, Sweet 16, even to the final 64 teams, all of those teams are good. And if you've got a glaring weakness, you're probably going to get beat at some point. And if you're solid on the defensive end, you generate pretty good shots on the offensive end and you can rebound, you're going to have a good chance to win, but you're also going to face teams that probably do those things well also. Yeah, so you would say defend. I mean, I, I think I said even earlier, defending, rebounding, and being efficient on offense. Like if you look at Michigan State stats, like so the people that are listening now that haven't heard us talk about this, I don't know what episode we went. We broke this all down. But, like, when you get a pretty, like, what, the 8 to 10, say you shoot 50% and you hold opponents to 40 and you're a 10 plus, a plus 10, like, you're about to have a pretty special season, right? We're talking, like, 25 and 5, like, 28 and 4 type stuff. If you look at Michigan State this year, I've got their stats up. And at field goal percentage on the year, they're 45, they give up 41. They're – uh, three point they they actually shoot it really well for a Michigan state. They're like close to 39 to 32. That's a pretty big split on that. So I think you're right. Like Houston, they defend and rebound so well, but then you put a kid like Sasser who they, I don't know that they've had somebody like that, a shot maker. You could ride out a shot maker. Like we saw UConn do that with, um, you know, Kimba Walker or Nate, like you get a shot making guard in the NCAA tournament. Watch out. If if you defend and rebound and then you can go make some shots, you get hot. That's where, you know, you go win a national championship. Yeah, like look at Virginia that year. They won it. They were 50-40 basically. And yeah. I think they didn't get enough credit on the offensive end. 50% from the field is hard to do. You know what I mean? And I, I think there's very few teams that are ever going to do that, have like a 7, 8, 9, 10% split in their thing. You know, like this year we were like 49 and 44 right? 5% split. We won 20 something games. And it's that little five percentage points there. You talk about like Michigan state, they're good enough to go make a run, but they're not dominant enough. They're not 50, 40, like to just hands down, give them, give them the tournament type thing. And so I think when you get into these final teams right here, they all usually have a positive split field goal percentage, offense and defense. And a lot of times it comes down to a couple percentage points. Can you get those couple extra sp stops or do you have a couple extra things in your offensive arsenal or a player that can get a bucket here, a bucket there to get you up over 47, 48%. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a much thinner margin than people think. And the, the last point I would make on this is, you know, it, it, let's just say that um, Virginia ran run and gun, right? Like they probably would go up on their offensive field goal percentage a little bit, but I also think their defensive percentage would go the other direction. And so, so let's just say that they're 48, 42. All right, maybe they go 50. They probably go 44, 45 on the defensive end. Like all of those things affect each other. That style of play is – and so it's easy to play armchair. I, I, I Barkley's quote the other day, um, I thought it was really interesting too. He said, you know, like the whole thing, like – and this is funny because we're a podcast given our opinion, right? But at least we have some basketball knowledge. But he said on these talk radios and everything – Anybody can call in and give their opinion. He said, we wouldn't call in on a doctor and, and evaluate the surgery. Well, I think you should have cut the, the vein there. I think you should have whatever it might be. We wouldn't do that. 
right? And so it's so easy to sit back and watch and 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 talk about, well, this coach didn't do this because they got upset, or this coach didn't do this because they got upset. Like, I just think it's, I, I mean, coaching is thankless in a lot of ways. Like, I mean, didn't Virginia win a share of the ACC title? That's freaking amazing. And they got beat by Furman, who's a pretty good basketball team, you know? Like, you know what I mean? Like, and so what? Like, it, okay. On a, on, a fluke, on a fluke play at the end, again, that's not – Furman earned it, right? They made a play, but on, it was a kind of a fluke play at the end. And sometimes two things can be true. You can just be a really good basketball team that loses to another really good basketball team. Winning is hard. Winning in your conference is hard. TJ, one more point on the Houston thing. So Houston was predominantly the number one team in the country a lot of the year. They won like what did they go thirty three and three or something. Yeah. You know what their splits were? They were forty six offense. They gave up thirty six. There's that ten percent we're talking about. Three point. They were thirty four. They gave up twenty seven. That's a seven split. And then they had a plus eight average rebounding margin. You put that together to our to what we're trying to tell you tell people listen is like. You're gonna win a lot of games. That's that's why they won 33 games. Yeah, we kind of tied point three and four together, style of play and what wins, you know. And this, I mean, I think as coaches, as you're evaluating the tournament, what you can learn from it, I think be careful, you know, because sometimes you can get enamored with a style of play, but it doesn't fit your players. You know, I'm always con- conscious and cautious of people that have all the answers. This is the right way to play the game, or this is the right way to do this. Like there, there, there's a lot of things that factor into that. And I think the number one thing a coach can do is figure out how to put their players in the best situation, not play your favorite offense, your favorite defense, your favorite style of play, like know your players, you know, be an expert on what they do really well, fit what you do to accentuate what they do the best. And that's going to give your team the best chance to win. It's a hard thing to do. It's a tough math problem. If everybody could do it, everybody would do it, but not everybody can do it. And 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 look, there's a lot of times I think I know going into the season and I'm not right. And we've got to work through it to get our players into their sweet spots. I think that's a really interesting thing. And I think coaches that constantly pursue, how am I putting my players in the best chance to really simply overstate it, like to get to 50% field goal percentage offense? And how am I getting them to a place of 40% field goal percentage defense? And that could be, 35, 45, or whatever it might be. But what am I doing to help them gain that split? Whether that's pressing people and running. So we're going to shoot 53% from the field because we get a lot of easy layups, but we're going to give up 45% or because we're going to slow down the pace of play. And we're, I I don't know. The answer is different for everybody. And what we do know, Sam, for sure, is that we can all be captured by the moment. We know that whoever wins the NCAA tournament this year or some Cinderella that had a style of play, a lot of coaches are going to gravitate towards that. And it might not be the best situation for their team. So I would caution coaches, find out what's best for your team. So Sam, hey, listen, that was interesting. We talked about rebounding, game pressure, style of play, what wins in the NCAA tournament. I know we could go on for hours about this. I know coaches have their opinions and all the things they see. Hit us up at hardwood underscore hustle. Give us your opinions. Give us your thoughts on, you know, what what do you think about rebounding? What style of play do you think is most effective? What do you think is really winning in these NCAA tournaments that we might not have talked about? Love to hear your thoughts. We didn't hit all of them, I know for sure. And there's a lot of good thoughts out there on all of those topics. But he is Sam. I am TJ. We are the Hardwood Hustle. Thanks again for tuning into this episode of The Hardwood Hustle, where we believe in the value of a coach. Be sure to check us out on Twitter and Instagram at hardwood underscore hustle to stay up to date on the latest episodes and share your thoughts with our coaching community. From The Hardwood Hustle team, thanks again. We can't wait to be with you again next week.